Good morning. Welcome to New Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. It is a good morning to be together, to be able to worship Christ. We, uh, here at New Baptist Church, we want to know Christ, grow in his word, and be a blessing where he places us. And uh, just uh, glad that you are here with us this morning. I do want to remind you, if you have uh, children that uh, you want to send back, we've got pre-K through fifth grade, uh, has kids' church. We release them right before the service, so they'll stay with you until, or I'm sorry, before the sermon, um, so they'll stay with you until then. Um, and uh, also want to, to just continue to remind you that uh, all of our services, uh, they do stream on Facebook, but they also um, are uploaded to YouTube. So if you miss a week or um, you're just, you just want to go back and fill in your notes or something, uh, you can go to YouTube and uh, our, our radio Bible class, uh, the Sunday morning worship service from the 11 o'clock service, and then uh, Wednesday evening pastoral devotions are all on the New Baptist Church YouTube page. And so you can find uh, any of those things. It's just a, a, we're learning new things through this time that um, just helps us to be able to, to uh, catch up and, and, and even if something connects and you just want to share it with a friend, that's, that's just a, an opportunity that we now have um, through what we're doing here. Um, as we grow in God's word, uh, we want to know it. And so I want to invite you this morning as we begin worship, uh, if you would stand and let's uh, recite together our memory verse from Matthew. Uh, this is the Beatitudes we're working through this year. So let's say it all together. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That one's a tongue twister. Join me as we pray. Lord God, thanks for this day. I thank you for uh, your word and uh, the encouragement it gives us, God, the, uh, the way that it transforms us, and God, that we can know you through your word. God, this morning, uh, we, we do. We want to know you more, and so uh, we want to see you and look upon you, and, and God, as, as uh, your word is proclaimed, as it's taught, as we sing your praises, and God, may you be pleased, and may you be at work transforming and making us the people that you want us to be. God, we pray uh, this morning that you just continue to, to lead us and guide us as we um, and go out into the world to be a blessing as you place us. We love you and we thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning. I have a new song, a newer song for you this morning. Uh, you may not know the words, and I know singing in a mask isn't always a great time, but this song is a good hand clapping song, so you can, you can sing and you can clap along with us this morning. Uh, just remain standing as we begin to worship.
God's Word. You can turn and, and watch as we read. It's from Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It is the word of God for us today.
uncertain times. Lord, speaking for myself, just a burden um, of knowing the right things to do is very heavy. Um, so we rely on you for guidance. What a powerful name. That we can rely on you when we don't know. When we're unsure. Be with us as we make decisions. Be with Trent as he comes. Speak through him. Open our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to say. It's in your awesome and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, now is the time that we dismiss, dismiss our children to Kids Church. If you've not been able to register, they're doing that in the back right now. But I've asked Chad if he could give us a drum beat to help march the children out to Kids Church. So let's clap along as, as Chad begins here. Awesome. Today we continue our study of the book of Revelation. It began last week, and the purpose I began last week is because we are in a season that we just need a word of encouragement. And the book of Revelation is written as a word of encouragement to the church. And um, that's why I am in it. Um, last week, if you were here, um, the, one of the focuses that I um, focused on in our passage last week was verse 7, which I called the first command of the book of Revelation. The command is the word behold. It is a verb in the imperative that means to see. It means to grasp. It means to understand. It means to live in the reality of. And I just made the connection that this is also the very last command of the Gospel of Matthew, to behold. To behold, Jesus says in Matthew, I am with you always. And we see that same command at the beginning of Revelation. Behold, of the Son, of, uh, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Behold, live in the reality of his coming. That there is something that God is doing in this world. Behold it. Now, last week I focused on the why, the command. This is the command. Today I want to add to this teaching and talk about the why. Why is it so essential that we behold the Lord in all of his glory and his majesty and power? That's where I am going today. Our scripture is Revelation chapter 1, 9 through 20. Um, I'm going to walk through that passage and, and um, just using scripture to understand the vision that John has. And then I want to come back to this question as to the why. Why are we to behold the Lord? What does it do to us? So that's the structure today. And if you have your Bible, let's begin. Beginning with John chapter 1, verse 9. And it reads, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I want to pause right here and just very briefly talk a little bit more about John, the author of this book. I believe that this is the same John who is the apostle, who wrote the gospel of John, also wrote the letters of John. And I think it is worth noting that in the gospel of john john would talk about himself and when he would talk about himself he would always talk about himself as the one that jesus loves and i don't think that john means that that jesus did not love the others that was his identity that's how he saw himself i am a person that god loves that's who i am that's that's my identity in this world but we see here in revelation that he uses a different way to identify himself he identifies with the church. He identifies with everybody else. And 
And, and he says, I, John, your brother, is a partner in tribulation, which simply means suffering or oppression or hardship. I'm with you in whatever hardship you're going through. I'm a partner with you in the kingdom, and I'm a partner with you in patient endurance. John is saying that in your faith, you're just like me, and I am just like you. We share the same suffering, the same promises, the same blessings, and the same hope. And John also says here in verse 9 that he was on an island called Patmos on account of Jesus. I've had the opportunity to be on this island twice. Um, both times they were some of my life highlights. Um, the island is not much more than just a big giant rock in the sea and, and um, about 12 miles in length. And there's a hook at top, which is about five miles across where that hook is at. That castle you see on the screen is an ancient monastery and um, going, it's, just, it's just amazing, very moving. And um, these are just a few pictures. When I put my sermon up as a, as a blog, my manuscript, I will include some photos if you wanted to see those. The Christian tradition says that John was on this island because he refused to offer sacrifice to the Roman emperor. And, um, and, and I'll talk more about that later on. Um, but we, we see here that John is exiled to this island. And it was on the Lord's Day, Sunday, and he was in the Spirit. To me, it simply means that he was enjoying a deep fellowship and communion with the Father. And it is here in this deep fellowship with God that God speaks to him. And I'm reading now from where we left off. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and to Theatria and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of God. In the book of Revelation, we are not always told what the symbols mean. When we are, it's great. That's really helpful, John. I wish you did that more. Um, but verse 20 here, we are told that he holds these, these seven stars and these seven golden lampstands he is, he is in the midst of. And I believe that we are given the meaning of these symbols in verse 20 because it is absolutely critical that we understand this. And I think that if we're not given the meaning of what these things are, we probably will not understand, not, not simply understand the book of Revelation, but we will come to a wrong understanding of what these candles, the seven candle stands are. In the Old Testament, and in Judaism today, possibly the most important symbol is the seven lampstands. Today it's simply called the menorah. In the Bible, it is seen in the book of Exodus when God tells Moses to make a lampstand to be placed in the tabernacle and kept forever lit at duty of the priest. Exodus 25, 37 reads, You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamp shall be set up as to give light in the space in front of it. And these seven lamps are placed in the temple, and they are tended by the priest. The lights are to never go out. When the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians, these seven lamps on this lampstand became a symbol or an image of the temple of God and God's presence among his people, no matter where his people were at. 
This is most clearly seen in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. He has a vision, and that image on the left is just a, is, it's actually from a manuscript that dates to 13, the 1300s A.D., um, describing Zechariah's vision. He has a vision of the seven lamps and the olive tree that surround it. And if you read on in that passage of Zechariah 4, the olive tree are the two offices that feed this, the great high priest and the king of kings. And that's his vision. And I think that we come to the beginning of Revelation, I think John is seeing the same vision. Except that he's not seeing two olive trees representing the high priest and the king of kings. He sees one person, Jesus Christ, who is the king of kings and who is the high priest. This vision of Zechariah was given at the time when the exiles were returning to rebuild the temple. And it was a great encouragement to the people. And I think the same thing is meant for us. John is receiving this vision of these seven lamps and the great high king and the great king of kings in the midst of them, tending them, supplying them. And this is why verse 20 is such a shocker for us today. That these seven lamps do not represent Israel, which is what everybody expects for them to represent. But these lampstands as we see in verse 20, represent the church. This means that the church, the community of people who believe upon Jesus Christ, are, as it says in Galatians 3, 29, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to their promise. Or as John says at the beginning of his gospel, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, by identifying the seven lamps as the seven churches. The word of God is saying that the church is the temple of the Lord, where God's presence dwells in the midst of this world. The Lord is in our midst. He is among us. We are a kingdom of priests, verse 6 of Revelation 1. And this number 7, the seven churches, again, is a symbolic number meaning all or fullness. And, and, and thus it means that when he talks about the seven churches of Revelation, he's talking about all churches geographically in every nation and every tribe. The whole church, not only geographically but temporally, throughout all of time. It means that we, New Baptist Church of Huntington, West Virginia, we are one of the lamps. We are included here. Jesus walks in our midst. And that we, this church, we are a temple where God's presence resides in this world and for this world. How awesome is that? Hallelujah. John then goes on to describe the glorified Lord in verses 13 through 16. And this description that he gives, and there's no image, there's no picture I can come up with that even comes close to this. His description of the glorified Lord in these few verses, I think, is possibly the most exalted and amazing and, and really one of the fullest images we have of the glorified Lord. And I believe that this image that we have of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, glorified, um, it, is, it reflects his excellencies. It speaks of his divine attributes and characteristics. And, and it's how we see this image of his glorified that we begin to understand who he is. Thus, as we read um, verse 13, in the midst of the land stands one like a son of man. And this phrase, son of man, is, is one of the favorite phrases that Jesus used to talk about himself. It was not simply about his humanity. He is fully human, but it was used in such a way to talk about his divinity. The Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 7 that speaks about the coming Messiah who shall receive the everlasting king kingdom and have dominion. And so here in Revelation, by that phrase, Son of Man, we are already being told that he is the King of Kings. And as his clothing is described, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. These are images. These are hints as to what he does. These are the garments of the great high priest. 
So not only is Jesus the king of kings, he is the great high priest that takes away the sins of the world. And moving on to verse 14, hairs of his head were white like white and wool, like snow, his eyes were like flame of fire. And I, and I see in, in this, what my mind jumps to here, it's speaking of his, his omniscience. He is wise and all-knowing. And my um, mind actually jumps to Psalm 139, verse 11, which says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. To me, those are these eyes of flames of fire, which means that there is no darkness he cannot see into. His gaze lights up everything. He sees everything. He is wise and knows all. And verse 15 speaks of his purity and holiness. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And throughout scripture, the image of a refiner's fire is always used to describe something that is pure and holy. And this is Jesus. Jesus is without sin. He is holy. He is pure and good. He is innocent and righteous. And in verse 15 and into verse 16, we catch a glimpse of his almighty power. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. We are told that these seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and I'll talk about that in the future. But I also think they represent stars. They represent the universe. They represent all of creation. And so Jesus in the, is holding all of creation in his hand. And the sword that comes out of his mouth is the power of his word, a word so powerful that what he speaks, it becomes. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being by this word. Jesus is the glorified Lord that John sees. And the glorified Lord, he, he sees the king of kings, the great high priest, the omniscient one who is wise and knows all, the Holy One of God who is without sin, and the Word of God through which all things are made and have their being. It's no wonder that he falls down as though dead. Throughout Scripture, we are given hints. We're given glimpses of the glorified Lord. And sometimes that glimpse is just a pillar of fire. I'm thinking of Abraham when God enters a covenant with him and that pillar of fire goes between those animals or the, is the Israelites as they come out of Egypt and the pillar of fire goes before them and sometimes we get more than that we have the Shekinah glory that comes down and fills the tabernacle at the end of the book of Exodus or when Isaiah goes into the temple and he catches a corner of God's robe that fills everything and, and we we see that when people encounter God's glory something happens to them they're changed Abraham is changed he not only becomes a father but he becomes a father in, in heart and attitude. Moses has changed. He was a person who did not want to be sent and used by God, but when he encountered God's glory, he became a person who would rather die than leave the presence of the Lord. Jeremiah is changed to have a spirit of endurance. Ezekiel and Daniel are changed. In the New Testament, we see Paul on the road to Damascus when he encounters the glorified Christ. His whole world is turned upside down. Thus, I think here, is a spiritual truth that I want to highlight this morning. Seeing, beholding the glory of the Lord changes you. Beholding the Lord of glory is a catalyst of change and transformation. This spiritual truth should not be a surprise for us. We know, um, we meaning human beings in general, we know that we are impacted and we are changed by what we see or experience. In recent years, our society has become more aware of what is called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, first recognized in mil military soldiers who witnessed the horrors of war and came back with all these different struggles. But we now recognize that PTSD is a disorder that can happen to anyone who witnesses or sees a traumatic event like a car accident or, or some form of physical abuse or an assault or a dangerous encounter with an animal. 
I think the COVID pandemic is going to cause some PTSD in young people in days ahead. PTSD is a serious mental condition that causes anxiety and anger and struggles of concentration, as well as the other hosts of just social problems. Now, if we accept that people who witness or go through something traumatic can be changed negatively, would that not mean that people who witness something beautiful and glorious can be changed positively? Do you think that it is possible to catch a glimpse of something so wonderful and so beautiful, so truly awesome and glorious that you are changed forever? I believe so. In truth, I believe that by encountering the glory of God is how we are made whole and transformed and changed to be like Christ. The world says that you are changed through hard work and self-improvement. The world says the more control you place upon yourself, the more rules that you follow and the self-discipline that you have will result in a better you. But what if? What if the world is wrong? What if a person is changed, really changed, really healed and made whole and transformed, not through laws of self-control, but through beholding the glory of God? The answer would be that life that is beautiful is a life that is turned towards the glory of God as opposed to a life that is turned towards the works of self-righteousness. You are made beautiful by beholding the glory of God. We're told this in Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all, who does that include? It includes all of us. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Seeing is becoming. I'm struck by the beauty that is promised when we behold the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed little by little over the course of a lifetime by degree into what? into the same image. What image is that? It is the image of the glorified Lord. It's the image of what we see in our Revelation passage today. The image of the Lord who is the King of Kings, the great high priest, wise and knowing, full of discernment, purified by the refiner's fire, infinitely holy, infinitely good, so powerful that he holds the universe in his hands, and by his word all things spring into creation. We are told in Scripture that as you behold him, you become like him from one degree to another. Seeing is becoming. Do you want greater purpose in your life? Then behold the glory of the Lord. Do you seek to care for people and to love better? then behold the glory of the Lord. Do you you desire to be wise, able to discern what is good and true? Behold the glory of the Lord. Do you seek to push back against temptation and the struggle with sin? Behold the glory of the Lord. Do you desire to get out of that hole of depression and find strength to do what is good and right? Behold the glory of the Lord. Seeing is becoming. Open up the eyes of your heart and behold his glory and so be changed and transformed into his likeness. You may be thinking to yourself, where is this glory? I've never seen the glory of God. God has never appeared to me in glory. Reading on in 2 Corinthians and just a few verses later in chapter 4, Paul says that God shines the glory of Christ into your heart through the gospel. For God, who said that light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul saw the glory of Christ with his eyes on that road to Damascus, but we see the glory of Christ in the gospel. The gospel is how God shines the glory of Christ into our lives. So how do you behold the glory of the Lord? You hang on to the gospel. You preach yourself the gospel. You read the gospel. You practice the gospel. You you behold the gospel through faith, trusting in God's spirit that that God may shine the glory of Christ into your heart. Are you being transformed from one degree of glory to another if you are not i wonder what you are beholding if seeing is becoming what are you seeing what are you beholding your greatest need mine as well is to radiate the beauty of christ that comes from beholding him behold the glory of the lord We come now to the end of the passage. John falls down as though dead. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus, the glorified Lord, lays his hand on John. And he says to him, and he says to you, fear not. You don't have to be afraid. Persecution, the future, tomorrow, the pressures that you are under, the disappointments you hold, you do not have to be afraid because Jesus holds authority. In his hand are the stars of heaven, and by his word all of creation came into being. He has overcome death and is alive forevermore. And in his hand, he holds the keys of death and hell. That's Hades. Which means that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. He is a way in which we behold the glory of God, by which we enter into fellowship with the Father. Therefore, fear not. I'm going to close with prayer now. And I just want to close in a time of prayer, seeking the thing, the glory of God, to behold it as we are instructed in Scripture. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we bow our heads in prayer, I am just mindful that, um, that we too often, that we so often, instead of seeking to behold your glory and fixing our eyes upon you we behold trash we fix our eyes on things of this world and and um and and what we fix our eyes on what we behold changes who we are so father through your spirit may you give us wisdom and a desire and passion to open our eyes to you may we see you um, through your word May we see you through your people. May we see you at work in this world. I thank you, Father. I thank you for this time, and I thank you for the spirit that you've given to us and your word, which which is where we behold your glory. I thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. In the scriptures, it talks about how, as Christians, we're promised that we're going to face trials of many kinds. Um, But it also promises that in the midst of our brokenness, that he will never leave us or forsake us, and that he is always with us wherever we go. He will make firm our steps, and he has overcome this world. And I just pray that this morning that we would all reflect that in the midst of the brokenness and the confusion and the chaos, um, the anxiety and the depression, that we would know that the Lord keeps his promises, and that's what we're going to sing about this morning. Send all sin in the closet, jackets by the door. Life 
and dead Scattered around the feet of the sycamore The waiting hands of winter Catch us when we fall Is it just me? I can't believe The green of spring was ever here at all You keep your promises Just like every perfect dream Withers, fades, and drifts away Feels like we're all falling with the leaves You keep your promises You keep your promises Closing song this morning is Open the Eyes of My Heart. If you all would stand with us this morning.
Gracious Father, we are so grateful for the promises that you, um, that you are so faithful. We're grateful for the beauty that you surround us with. And, and Lord, I'm just grateful for this beautiful season that we're about to enter into in fall. And may we, as we step outside and see the leaves changing and feel the crisp air, may we just be reminded of your glory, be reminded of you. And may your beauty change us, Father. And Father, may we just remain focused on your word, on your gospel. Um, the grace that you've given to us through the Son. We are grateful, Father. And it's in that, um, through the power of your Spirit and the presence of your Spirit, I ask your hand upon these people here today and those who are watching. Watch over them, protect them, and as we have just sung, um, open the eyes of their heart, Lord. Help them to see you at this time and in this day. In Christ's name, amen. 